to, to some people. Uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's let's move right in. I actually have a full full deck here. Um, I want to start though by saying I think any of you that have participated in nature or citizen science, you know it's fun. And um, that some people would say that's the most important part. And, and it is. Uh, we're connecting people with nature, we're getting people out there learning about science and nature and engaging in conservation. So uh, I'm not going to be talking about this, I'm going to focus on the science side, but I just want to say right up front, it's more to it than that. And uh, let's just, you know, we're going to park that, but uh, not lose sight of that as well. So something uh, a colleague of mine years ago gave me a, a saying that I've always took to heart is, <clears throat> begin with the end in mind. And so that's what I'm going to do here. Another way of saying that is if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. So citizen science has a purpose and the end game by and large, there's a lot of sides to it, but is uh, conservation of biodiversity. So I want to start, let's say, let's call it providing some context. Uh, what are we trying to achieve in the end here? Uh, it's got to do with conservation. What does that look like? And then, uh, you know, what is the science we, we were talking about in detail? Uh, citizen science is just a form of science. So I'm going to spend a few minutes going over that as well. And then we'll take a deep dive into the concert, uh, citizen science side of things. Um, the way this has come about is that Nature Alberta is going to increase its engagement in this area. I've spent the last, well, since November, I guess, starting um, looking at the mostly on the science side, what's happening? Like that's where I kind of set up this talk. You push the send button on your phone and the observation whisks itself away somewhere into the ether. Well, what happens to it? So I, I wanted the answer, answer that question for myself and for Nature Alberta, and I'm sharing with you what I've learned here today. Uh, it's certainly not exhaustive, uh, but uh, you know, I think there's some important highlights that'll come forth. So <clears throat> conservation. Uh, why do we do this? What's the goal? So uh, I divide this into two parts. And one is I call it the aspirational goal of conservation. It's the one that we often talk about. It's to restore and maintain species and ecosystems as they would be in the absence of human disturbances. It's the way we'd like it to be. Uh, diagrammatically, it might look something like this. I, I'm simplifying here, but I'm trying to give you a sense of uh, in bare bone basics. We used to have a natural state. Now we've kind of mucked it up. Uh, conservation is about identifying the reasons why it has changed, we'll call those threats, and then figuring out how to bring it back to that natural state. That's the way, if you want to look at it in very simple terms, conservation works. And there are some examples that do work that way in very limited contexts. But for the most part, and, and I should mention, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a scientific endeavor more than anything else. But for most actual applications, it's much more complicated than that. It's really a social process. What we manage for is the result of a compromise with many other things. We want to chop down trees and make lumber. We want to dig for oil and so many other things. So biodiversity ends up being one of many things that we try to manage for. So really the, the uh, enterprise of conservation is uh, a search for that optimal uh, uh, solution, uh, that balance. We don't always get it right, but that's where it's going. So in a nutshell, in practice, conservation really is about decision-making. Here's what, again, if we look at it in a model format here, it might, this is what it might look like. Uh, all of you here today are in this bubble here, the public slash stakeholders. We all have uh, a voice in what happens uh, to wilderness, to biodiversity in Alberta. I uh, still have the science domain, but it's now uh, providing information. Let's take caribou. If they're going down, it's scientists out in the field that are measuring uh, what's happening to them. Uh, they don't say if this is a problem or not. If it's a problem, that's, that's society's choice. So that's happening here. And then there's this bubble here of decision makers. Scientists don't get to make the rules. Uh, you, you can do a study on caribou and find X, Y, Z. That doesn't mean that you get to tell a forestry company what they're going to do. It doesn't work like that. Science in, in this social model is an advisor. 
It's an advisor to the public, to stakeholders, and to decision makers. So I think it's important to understand that context. When you're setting citizen science information, it's in this uh, domain here, where, what we're talking about. So let's look at uh, this a little bit more carefully um, in, in the conservation aspect. There's truly two kinds of science. Uh, there's applied science, and the idea there is what I've been talking about here. Uh, you're supporting decision making in some form or other. And in conservation, I've picked out four or five, sorry, of the main areas where science does some heavy lifting in the process. As I've mentioned, it, it's, it's uh, very well situated to identify problems and to quantify the threat. So if a caribou are going down, what percent per year? Uh, how long until they're all gone? Those are questions that, that science is there to answer. It's also uh, number two here is identifying how the whole darn system works. Uh, what are the main drivers? Uh, caribou populations, what, what controls them? And uh, what things do we not know that we have to spend more time figuring out till we're confident we understand how it all works? Then number three is devising management option. Okay, we can understand hopefully some basic aspects of how a system works. Uh, what can we do about it? What are those levers? the management tools that we have to make some changes, to make a difference. And uh, number four here is taking that a step farther, not only what are the tools, but what effects are they gonna have? So the big role of science is as a predictor. Not only do we wanna understand it, we wanna predict what'll happen if you do this or do that. And so that, that's a big part of it. And lastly, uh, monitoring implementation, success or failure. So we go ahead and pick something and we do it. Uh, did it work? Is it not? Why not? So these are the kinds of applications that science, citizen science, all of it is being funneled in towards these kinds of roles in this bigger enterprise of conservation. Uh, if you put it all together in a, in a picture, I, I, not that it's really relevant here, but I spent a lot of time making this, so I wanted to show it. Uh, this is caribou. This is what we know of it today. There's your caribou population. All the middle parts are the different pieces of the system that have a role in determining what the caribou population will be from year to year. And the things that are circled in red are those management levers. Those are the things we can control, we can do something about. We can reclaim seismic lines, we can put rules on uh, how forestry is done, we can set up new protected areas, we can kill wolves, we can put calves in the pen. Uh, what'll happen if we do? We can make predictions about that. So, so this is the bread and butter of conservation science is doing stuff like this. Um, I, I don't want to leave this out. The other part of science, of course, is basic science, where it's not necessarily motivated by a specific question for a specific application. Just want to understand how nature works. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's the foundation for all applied science. You couldn't do applied science without that big foundation of basic science to work from. So, you know, we've gone on into fair detail here about conservation. I keep saying science has got all these important roles and it's a big deal. Well, why is it such a big deal? So I, I want to spend a few minutes to go into what we're talking about here. What is science? So there are two definitions. One is that it's a body of knowledge about how the world works. It's that accumulated body and it includes observations, includes the analysis that we've done and the conclusions or the hypotheses that we come up with explaining how things work. Uh, what's important is that they're recorded and they're shared. And we live in a period of time now is unparalleled, right? In terms of having access to this body of knowledge. It's just astounding. Uh, I'm showing here a Google Scholar. Uh, you type in the word you know, woodland caribou and you're gonna come up with hundreds and hundreds of peer reviewed articles, this database, everything that's been written about woodland caribou, it's, it's there. There are other databases too, but Google Scholar is, is you know, available to all of us with no charge. There are also databases. I'm showing here the government of, of Government of Alberta um, GIS mapping database where you can go and grab a lot of different layers of, of, of maps. There's all kind of databases online for us to draw on. So this is that science is a body of knowledge. It's also 
a method of acquiring that knowledge. So it's also a process. So some key features are, <clears throat> first of all, it builds on the work of others. Um, and this is where it's so important to write things down and to share them. So a grad student doesn't have to start out with, you know, the, does the does the sun revolve around the earth? We know uh, a lot of basics and we can keep moving, uh, pushing back the frontier of what is unknown to from what used to be unknown. Uh, another key feature um, is that science is skeptical and conservative. So, um, you know, you have to develop a bit of a thick skin. It's not like when you put a group of people together in a room and 10 people, nobody wants to disagree with anybody. It's not polite. This is just not what we do. And for societies, that's a good thing. But for science, it's not. You have to be able to accept, you have to actually want uh, somebody to challenge what you're putting forth and understand that evidence trumps opinion. Uh, it doesn't matter what you think, it's the evidence that ultimately it, it needs to drive things forward. And we always understand, you have to be humble that uh, we can never be certain. We can only keep working towards that, that truth that we all seek. So, so that those are key features of, of how science works. Uh, lastly, I'm pointing out here that it, has or we draw on a lot of tools to transcend our human abilities, our eyes and ears. We have microscopes, we have computers, we have uh, all kinds of, of tools that uh, allow us to do things, especially today that, that you couldn't do uh, just as uh, you know, using your own resources. So uh, a saying I really like taking to heart is this one by Richard Feynman. The first, principle, the first principle of science is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So the idea here is the human brain is, is astounding, right? Our ability to make observations, to draw reason conclusions about how things work is, is just truly tremendous, but it's not infallible. In fact, we all have in us hardwired shortcuts that, you know, works fine perhaps in the African savannah, savannah, but not so good, you know, when it comes to pushing forward the frontier of science. Some of these, their biases that we just, you can't help them. Even if you know it, it's hard to avoid them. Like one of them is this uh, anchoring. Like once you think you figured something out, it's really hard to get off that, even if there's evidence to the contrary and switch your mind and, and, and look at something a different way. So science, as we've learned over the years about our fallibility and have structures, methods in place to counteract or at least to minimize those known shortcomings of our, of our brains. And so just to list them quickly here, not an exhaustive list, but these are the kinds of tools in the toolkit that science has that allow us to do a, a maximize our ability of getting reliable information despite our own limitations. So we've figured out ways of making good observations and this will carry on to the citizen science part, right? We've figured out how to set up studies, sampling techniques, and treatments and controls and all that and to standardize the way we do things so that our observations, we get the most value out of every observation and that's and it's reliable or as reliable as possible. We've got tremendous um, uh, you know, techniques, statistical analysis, mainly for doing something with all that data that we've collected. So, and that keeps changing it. it it's leaving me in the dust, you know, with, with, when now, you know, there's now computer learning has really upended the old traditional ways of doing statistics. So we're always moving forward. And we have, it, that's a tremendous tool for understanding what our data mean and drawing out, you know, that signal from all the noise. Uh, then the next point was uh, synthesis and prediction. So we can develop models, like I showed you the caribou models or computer models to help us synthesize all those little bits of information and then ask what if questions. And so that we can make predictions for maybe something in a future period of time, maybe in a different place than where we originally studied it. We want to be able to extrapolate our learning and apply it in all the other places. And finally, uh, as I mentioned already, there are tools to transcend our, our abilities all the way along from observation through data analysis and data sharing and so on. 
So um, just before we just finishing off here, when it comes to conservation, if we kind of narrow field of science is huge. Now, if we look at conservation science, for the most part, and I'm again, simplifying here, uh, generally here, there are two main forms. We spend a whole lot of time monitoring that's where we're identifying problems, watching caribou numbers going down. Well, that's it's monitoring um, and tracking progress in terms of our efforts to implement conservation methods. So we do a lot of effort is put into monitoring. And then of course, research studies where there is a question, we want to answer the question, we want to understand how something works, and then we want to make predictions. So that is a big chunk of what we do with all parts of science, but certainly applied to conservation. Now there's uh, a few key topics. It's a very broad field. So I, I'm, what I got six here, uh, that it's called the highlight reel. This is where a lot of, uh, proportionally, a lot of the effort has gone in in conservation science. Uh, tons and tons of effort on figuring out how many of, of every species there are and how does that, what's the trend over time? That's critical because if a, a species is doing, conservation is always capacity limited. We can only do a little bit relative to what we'd like to do. So if a species is doing fine, we don't really have to put a lot of effort into it. We're not gonna do a lot of conservation on coyotes. They're doing fine just by themselves. So by uh, measuring species abundance and figuring out who's not doing well, we know where we can uh, put our effort to have the maximal benefit. Uh, next is distribution. Tons and tons of work, of course, on animal distribution, plant distribution. We want to understand, especially habitat relationships. We know that one of the biggest drivers of those declines of species is that they're related to habitat. There's problems with habitat. We've turned it into a canola field or whatever. Well, anyway, we want to understand what the needs are, the habitat needs are of, of, of these species so that we can do something about it. We also want to know about ecosystem function broader than just species. Uh, we want to understand how fires work in boreal forests so that uh, when we want to know how it differs from cutting down the trees so we can try to make that harvest and look more like fire. So a lot of effort put into those kind of things. Protected area design, of course, that's the, the cornerstone of conservation. Uh, where should we protect? How big should these areas be? How should they be connected and so on? That's a big chunk of, of conservation science. Phenology, the timing of natural uh, events uh, like flower budding or uh, flowering of plants. Um, that's become really high profile now with climate change. We want to understand how things are, are changing in, in terms of when they happen. And uh, I, I add here, this is a kind of a newer piece um, of conservation science. It's the social dimension. We don't have to just study caribou. Uh, it, it actually is a lot broader than that. I said conservation is about making decisions. It's about societies. And so it makes sense that we should include social science as part of what conservation examines or, or, and or economics. And, and certainly that's become a big thing. So before I, I I'm going to jump into citizen science momentarily here, but I didn't want to leave the conventional science world behind without mentioning ABMI. It's something that is truly unique and special, and, and uh, we have it here in Alberta. It's, um, I, I don't know there's anything like it in, on the planet, at least at the scale, spatial scale, and the number of species involved. The Alberta Biodem Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. So it began in the early 2000s, took a few years to get rolling. Uh, the foundation is a grid of 1,656 survey points that get regularly surveyed. I'm showing you the grid here. The, um, the uh, purple circles, every circle represents one survey point in this grid. So the purple are the initial survey. Uh, that was, it's been done once since the year 2000. The uh, red are places that have been visited twice to date. The, you probably can't see the little white ones, but those are places that they haven't surveyed yet. Eventually, it'll all look like this bottom part of uh, southern part of Alberta. So the idea is to revisit them every five, or it's gone a little bit slower. Um, it's more like eight years now. And it's still at an early stage, um, you know, to do long-term trends, but it is getting there. And uh, very importantly, there's a data portal. And just to show you what that looks like, I'm going to use house rent as an example for, for the next few slides. So let's look at what ABMI tells you. Well, first of all, here's the map, the grid, uh, where uh, uh, 
actually somebody has gone and, and done a site visit. The red are these areas that have been visited uh, where they actually found a house wren. The gray is where they have visited, but there was no house wren. And the little dots, the tiny ones, are haven't got there yet. So the we're, all those tools of science that I told you go in, have gone into the design of this. They've gone into the design of the protocols, how they go about measuring and into the analysis. So there aren't all that many points of where house runs were, but what's important is that they've measured areas and they know where there was no house run, there really aren't any. They're, they're very confident of that. And with that, they can develop statistical models. And that's what you see on the right. This map on the right is a map of abundance of house runs, not based on where individual birds were seen, but models that have been built up linking these points where they have been seen and where they have not been seen with a whole bunch of predictor variables like the local climate, elevation, the type of vegetation, and so on. You can build a model and it'll predict whether, given these variables, house rent will make that home or not. And more than that, it'll tell you roughly how many you can expect. So they have, I don't know what the number is right now, but a lot of species have been uh, analyzed this way and you, it's all free. Just jump on the data portal and it's there for you. A tremendous resource. I think I skipped over earlier. There's also a lot of um, remote sensing. So uh, the human footprint is, is a big focus of what AVMI looks at. How, what, what are we doing to the landscape, road seismic lines and all the rest of that. Okay, one last thing I want to just point out, you know, I'm obviously a cheerleader for science. <laughs> I think it's the best thing since sliced bread, but it has limitations. Uh, first of all, uh, when we get talking about ecology, we're talking about extremely complex systems. And, you know, we ecologists have physicist envy, <laughs> some do, you know, we can't take it into the lab, or at least not very often, and take it apart and push it and study it in a controlled environment. It's, there's so many interacting parts, you know, you have to study it out where it is, m most places. And so that really makes it difficult. I mean, the world is large and there aren't that many scientists to do the work. And so it becomes hard to extrapolate. You do a study in one area, does it apply in the North? Does it apply in Saskatchewan? We don't know, it's hard to be sure. How it'll, what will it happen in 20 or 50 years ago from now, sorry? Will these findings still hold? So it's a hard nut. Ecology is tough. Um, then the other piece is a, touched on already, we've got huge capacity constraints. There aren't that many scientists and even fewer ecologists, not that many at all. Uh, and another reality is most of the actual heavy lifting is done by grad students. Uh, you'll have a professor at university and maybe, uh, you know, I always think of a, a duck and a bunch of ducklings behind a dozen uh, grad students doing actual field work going out there, but that has implications. It means that a lot of the studies that are done are two or three years in time, uh, because that's, you know, then they graduate and they, they need to move on. So there are limitations uh, to what we can do as science, even though we have all those tools, it doesn't mean we can apply them because it just isn't the horsepower to do it. Last thing is, uh, and of course, if you want to do the dotted line, we're going to citizen science filling a gap here momentarily. Uh, last point, I just wanted to say that I don't know, the picture I put forth, if it sounds like it really works well, reality is it doesn't. Uh, the decision-making processes are muddy and they don't always work. Um, and it'd be nice if you know applied research was always linked to real conservation decisions, but it's all loose. And uh, sometimes studies are off on a dead end somewhere and they never, never really get used. Um, it's just the way it is, it's, it's no, king somewhere dictating how all the pieces should fit together or you know like a puppet here managing all the parts this isn't a, a system that just runs on its own and it's it's uh, not always connected as good as it might be okay switching gears citizen science so <clears throat> what is it uh, i pulled here a quote from a recent paper um a review paper with the whole you know one of those paragraph long list of names behind it so i you know it, to me it feels like one of these um summary kind of definitions that we can use 
That, that definition is that citizen science refers to the practice of engaging the public in a scientific project, a project that produces reliable data and information usable by scientists, decision makers, or the public. And it is open to the same peer review that applies to conventional science, is indistinguishable from conventional science, apart from the uh, participation of volunteers. So now you can read that in two ways. One is, you know, perhaps as a promoter of citizen science, you can say, good, everything we do is science. Somebody's writing on my screen and it's not me. Um, I don't know how to stop that. Maybe I'll ask politely, don't, don't draw on the screen. Anyway, point is you can read this and say, hey, great, all citizen science is science. It says so right here. Uh, but there's another way to you flip that around and say, only citizen science that meets these criteria, all, only projects that meet those criteria are actual science. So some projects may not qualify. And I think that probably is closer to the mark. If we want to talk about citizen science, my, my opinion is this does feel right to me. We should expect that citizen science plays by those rules. They're pretty good ones. So why wouldn't we follow those that kind of guidance? Of course, the um, major change here, um, <laughs> looking at the blue lines, <laughs> and, and I thought they'd disappear, but they're, they're not. Anyway, the big change. Uh, the world is changing right underneath us in so many ways, and citizen science is one of those. And the one of the big reasons is this device here. We're all carrying you know, mainframe computers of the past in our pockets now. Uh, these allow three critical things. One, they automatically set the time of any observation. We know when it happened. They have, everyone's got the GPS locator there, so we know where it happened. And lastly, it's so easy to share this stuff. So this is behind the revolution in citizen science. Citizen science is obviously not new. We've been doing this well forever. The first scientists were citizen scientists. And even when we think of it more in recent terms, like the Christmas bird count or breeding bird survey. They've been around for a long, long time, many decades. So citizen science isn't new, but what's new is this, and this is what's causing the revolution. It's the phone. Now let's just talk about some, some attributes, some general attributes. Citizen science has some core strengths. And so I'm listing them here. First of all, we've got a huge number of observers. And you'll see it's, it's astronomical. We're talking about in, in the millions and millions. Wide spatial scope. We're talking about the planet Earth. That's the scale we're talking about, not a little study. Um, we've got, as I mentioned, reliable information on the time and location of observations. Those are critical if you want to analyze and do something with the information. And as I mentioned, we've got such a simple way of sharing data through online portals. Okay, it's not all roses. Um, I, I've, the way I've come at this is using the word variability because some citizen science is every bit as good as anything you'd want to cook up in a, in a conventional science sense. Others is quite murky and there's a huge range, it's a spectrum. So I don't think we should look at this as it's good, it's bad, it's black or white. Let's understand the variability. And the variability comes in three key areas. One is the quality of observations. Um, some uh, citizen science initiatives, let's say the breeding bird survey I'll talk about in a minute. You've got people who are, are expert birders. They're probably better than a lot of the grad students doing the, the you know, work out there. So uh, we've got sometimes really high quality. Other times a novice might really not understand you know, what they're doing, yet the observations go in. So we've got a huge variability in quality of observations. Um, same with study design and analysis. Some are highly structured. Others are just throw in whatever you got into the big bucket that's all a big pile of observations will do something with it. So again, huge spectrum. And lastly, application to conservation decision making. Some have a direct pipeline to decision makers and decision making. Others are often a backwater, probably will never be seen. So the way I thought of coming about this is to um, look at a few 
classic examples or high profile examples. There are hundreds and hundreds of citizen science projects. Obviously, I couldn't cover them here today. So what I'm going to do is take a deep dive on a few what I think are illustrative examples. And I picked ones that people are likely to use, you know, so it's, it's relevant as possible. Uh, before I get there, boy, this is a real Ray, Did you want to maybe um, stop share and start? Yeah, I think if you stop sharing and then restarted sharing, that might clear it off for Let us. That. Give that a try. Ah, should have done that earlier. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So before we get into the these applications, I wanted to just make a point here about how this can all work. Let's say that I take 10 of you and each of you every year for the next 10 years picks a spot and measures the house rent. What might we get out of that? Well, I don't know, but I've drawn some kind of, you know, made up graph. You know, some of you might monitor in June, some in September, some might look in your backyard, some might look in optimum habitat, uh, some might look for three minutes, some might spend the whole day looking for house rents. We're going to see observations all over the place. Can we get much information out of here? Can we say, if, is there a trend? What's the abundance? Jeez, you know, it really is hard to say. But what if we, instead of just leaving it open, we use that, you know, scientific approach and we structure how those, are dis those observations are made. So same 10 people, but maybe we give you a, a little bit of a course on the song of the house wren, what it looks like. And then we tell you, you you're all are going to measure in the same place and you're going to do it the same time of year. And you're going to, uh, um, you know, do everything in a standardized way. Well, the numbers haven't changed, but, I, you know, the odds are you're going to get actually a fairly reliable trend line. Of course, the population itself pops up and down, but you can have I think pretty high confidence that you're seeing what's really out there. And of course, that's how the breeding bird survey works. We standardize everything. Now, does that mean that this is the only way to do reliable citizen science? You know, we have to have breeding bird surveys, all the rest is garbage. Well, not at all, because I said one of the powers of, of citizen science is numbers. So instead of 10 people or 100, what if we had 10,000? That's the number of e-birders in Alberta. What if we had those 10,000 people monitor house rents over, over time? Well, there's still going to be a huge, a huge amount of variation um, because people are doing things in their own way, not standardized. But, you know, you give this much information to a statistician, they'll have no problem in drawing out a trend line to see what, there's a signal here that's telling us what the population underneath all that noise is doing. And it's the power of numbers that allow us to do that. So this is what I want you to understand is that we don't, we can do something with data when we have massive numbers. This is the power of the phone and, and a new way of going at citizen science. Last thing I wanted to mention, you know, I promised you, wait, what happens to your observations when you leave your phone? Well, here you are. Uh, the, 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 the journey is, it, it ends up in a database somewhere. Uh, depending on what platform you are. Breeding bird survey, you know, you, it used to be you would just mail in your reports, you know, now it's on the web. eBird, iNaturalist, it's all done on the phone. These are massive database. You push eBird magically through the ether, your observation lands in Ithaca, New York, in a mainframe somewhere. I don't know where it's stored physically, uh, but, but it resides in a database somewhere. And there are all kinds of databases. I'm just mentioning a few, a few of the biggest ones. And from there, this is the key point, it goes on to the user community because there is always a risk that it stops here. Um, you know, it sits in a database and nothing happens. There's this other step required of analysis. So citizen science in all science is not just making the observation, it's the sharing of it and analyzing it and then doing something with it. And it is just as able to do that as any kind of other science is. But it does require collaboration. It doesn't happen by itself. So uh, I'll talk when I go through these examples how that happens or doesn't happen. The users are quite varied. I, one thing I wanted to point out is that naturalists themselves, are, I, if I got the information right, are the biggest user base of all. People love to, 
to, to make observations. They love to see what's happening. They, and you can, with these databases, you can go online very quickly and see your observations, see others, and see data products. So big user is just naturalists themselves. Um, huge role for educators. You know, if you're trying to teach somebody about house rents, <laughs> you've got it made today. There's so much information available to you. Uh, we talked about researchers, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, some data are better suited to research than others, but they definitely are perking up their ears. And goes, um, I'm here today, you know, uh, as, as a Nature Alberta person, we, you know, Ingos definitely depend on this kind of stuff. And ma resource managers, wildlife managers. Uh, again, it's early days, but we're, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Things are perking up, let's say. So a few key examples. Uh, I'm a little bit behind, but I'm, I'm going to do my best not to, to run over here. Um, I want to start with the breeding bird survey. So this is a map of the roots. So you can see that it's, I think it's in Mexico now, but the map, map I got was, was Canada and the United States. So each one of these lines is a root. And the way it works is that people are assigned roots and there are um, 50 stops. It's a, you go along there, make a stop uh, every 0.8 kilometer, get out of your car, look, listen, and write down everything you can hear that seems to be within the 400 meter range. People who do this are trained. They know what they're, they're doing. Um, it's on a single day. It's roughly the same kind of year. There's a window and um, you know, you're encouraged to go when the weather's nice and you can actually you know, see and hear things, not in the middle of a storm. So that's the way it works. It's highly standardized. It's structured. This is the Cadillac. It doesn't get better than this. Conventional science does not have anything better than this. It started out, you know, 50 years ago. So there's no database on birds for sure. And, and nothing else that I'm aware of that can compete. Uh, there's Christmas bird count. It's similar. So I, I, I shouldn't say nothing. But um, in conventional science, people use this. Uh, so yes, just some quick background. It began in, well, 1970 is where it kind of really starts. Um, there's somebody in charge, and that's important, Canadian Wildlife Service, because this doesn't just end up in a heap somewhere. Somebody's doing something with it. That's Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, they're the ones that organize volunteers. So if you want to get involved, they're always looking for recruits. You look for your regional coordinator and away you go. Um, data are analyzed by Canadian Wildlife Service. So again, that's key. Somebody's doing something with your data. They do this on a yearly basis. They give the uh, estimates of abundance, species composition, and trends. This is one of the best databases we have to show long-term change of, of, of birds. And again, data freely available and, and open to the public, very important. So where does it go? What's the end product? Yeah, this is one of those where there's a direct pipeline to uh, managers, to research community. It's, it's been used for years, it's still used. Uh, reports like uh, every five years, the federal government puts out a status report on species in Canada. Breeding bird, bird, uh, breeding bird data are in here. There's a more detailed study just on birds. That one, that one comes out every year. Breeding bird survey data has been the lifeblood of this. So you know your stuff is, your information is going somewhere and it's having an effect. You get output like this. Since 1970, we can track bird groups, individual species or groups. We can see from here, grassland birds, aerial insectivores, they're in big trouble, right? Um, we can also know that, you know, maybe the sport hunters have figured something out. Maybe some of our, you know, taking DDT out of the system or not shooting at hawks, I don't know, but we certainly are, are seeing good trends in waterfowl and others in the middle. So this is information you can work with in terms of conservation action, knowing where to put your effort and, and uh, starting to do research on trends. So I'm going to go through all, all of the example strengths and weaknesses. So a breeding bird survey has a lot of strengths. Its structured design is central. Standardized observation, central, long-term, beautiful, annual professional data analysis, and strong link. These are, these are why it's the Cadillac. It's really uh, doing a job very well. But it's not perfect either. Nothing is. It has limitations. First of all, it's restricted to roads. And so you, if you saw that graph, or that map I showed you, the top third of Alberta only has a couple, three breeding bird survey lines. It's, it's, there's just nobody up there. Um, so we have poor coverage. Um, it's only birds. 
happens? What about all the other species on the planet? And it's a, a window, it's breeding birds. So we don't know what happens the rest of the year. And of course, some species are hard to count. Um, okay, moving on, eBird. Um, this is not the Cadillac, but it's the big daddy. <laughs> half, more than half of, of all citizen science observations these days are coming in through eBird. So it's huge. Um, I'm sure many of you have used it, but in case not, you know, it couldn't be easier. It's an app on your phone. It automatically sets the time. It's got your GPS, so it knows where you are. You start the checklist, and you just walk. You, know, you can stand where you are, you can walk. And anything you see, you just add a count. It even helps you, you know, you just type in the word mallard, M-A-L, and they'll get the species for you. Um, you put it in. The idea here, though, which is critical, is that you have to record everything you see in here. Because for the analysis, I'm going to show you the absence of a bird in your area is just as important as its presence or, or nearly. And so there, uh, if you have a complete checklist, when you're finished, you push stop and there's a checklist. It's complete if you have indeed recorded everything you've encountered. So then, as I say, the data whisks away to, to Ithaca. Yeah, it'll give you a route. And there's a, a GPS stamp for all of your observations. So, so the analysts know, you know where these birds are. And they, again, they have maps of the vegetation and stuff. And they do the same analyses that I've told you for AVMI at a coarser scale. So it's a new kid on the block, began in 2002, especially the last 10 years is where it kind of went exponential. Global scope. Over a billion observations. This isn't a typo. A billion observations. That floors me. <laughs> How can that be? And it is. So that's where data overwhelms statistical noise. There's still, again, it still has its problems, but this makes a big difference. In Alberta alone, 10,900 eBirders, 10,000. Um, as I said already earlier, half of all uh, observations are from eBird. Again, there's somebody. You know, you're putting out a call when you, you press, press send, you're sending a message out to the world. Uh, there's somebody picking up the phone and it's the Car Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. Uh, there's local support from Birds Canada as well. There's somebody there answering the phone. Um, and I'll see, I'll, I'll mention what they do. Um, it's, there's also a, a, a bit of a review process. It's somewhat limited, but if you say you see 23 uh, house uh, um, wrens, you know, in your two minute walk, somebody is gonna get in touch with you and say, really? You know, so uh, they'll check the, the, if it's real or if there's a very strange sighting, doesn't belong in your area, it'll get flagged. Maybe it's real, but they want it, they'll, they'll ask and try to make sure that it is real. And again, data on maps freely available. So let's have a look. Uh, if any of you have looked up a bird, house wren in Google, probably you'll end up at all about birds. It's usually the first thing that comes up. That's the Macaulay Library that's run by the Cornell Lab. Everything about you want to know about your species is here. They've got something like a million sound recordings. So if you want to listen to what it sounds like, that's your place to go. Um, you know, pictures, uh, you know, tremendous number of them, everything about the bird, it's all there. Okay, so that's a kind of that database, very good resource. Then you go to the, the data product section, you'll get uh, something like this, the range. So the red is the breeding season. So here's our birds. Uh, the, this dark cyan here is the winter time and this purple, who knew? <laughs> I didn't, uh, house wrens are really found all year long in South America. So you get that, that's pretty darn cool, right? I mean, imagine how different that is compared to the old days of your bird book where you had the little map of, of range. Now, now you've got this. Well, we're not done yet. They do the same statistical modeling that I said that AVMI does. So they don't just take your dots, they connect them and extrapolate them spatially and you know, end up with these global maps of distribution. So you can see what the, it's not abundance, but it's relative abundance. It's how much, you know, relative to adjacent areas. 
you know, on first approximation, it looks a lot like the AVMI stuff. I'm pretty sure AVMI does a better job. They have much more detailed uh, layers that they work with, much more detailed vegetation and so on. But at first approximation, and certainly at this global, you know, hemisphere scale, it's, it's just fine. Now we're not done. If you haven't been on there recently, you know, it'll, this will blow your socks off um, here. So not only do you get the um, range and the relative abundance, you can get that by week of the year. So yellow is low abundance, deep purple is high abundance, and I'm going to press play here. Now we're in, we're in January, right? So there's no wrens here. They're all down here. They're in Florida, <laughs> the rest of the sunbirds, right, in Mexico. And away we go. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that does something for me. I don't know about you. But anyway, yeah, you can do that. They don't have all birds, but they have a lot. Um, so a lot of very good products, educational value, value to birders. I mean, your observations are definitely having, uh, paying a dividend and you get it as, it, as a naturalist, you get it right back, uh, aside from anything else that's happening. Oops, I better go. Okay, who else is out there? Well, scientific publications, we're on that exponential curve. This is not just eBird, but eBird is, is most of it. Um, and it's, it's growing all the time. So uh, to be honest, a lot of those are, geez, we got all this data, how do we analyze it? So there are a lot of statistical analysis paper trying to figure out how to, it's new, how do we work with all the problems and get, get that signal? But the point is they are taking stock and they are getting more and more awareness of this massive treasure trove of data. There are also applications. Those are harder to find. I mean, they just don't get published as often. It's uh, anybody who's doing a management application, it is harder to get those published in peer reviewed literature, but there are some. I picked out one as an example. So we know sometimes eagles fly into these um, wind turbines, right? And get killed. So US Fish and Wildlife, uh, has a management responsibility. They don't want that to happen. So we've got, they've got all these people applying to develop more windmills, right? That's the thing that's happening. Well, they needed a fine grained abundance map of eagles that says, this is where is low risk. This is very high risk. This is used all the time. We shouldn't put any more windmills there. And they went and looked at all the data sets there are and like, you know, uh, everything that's available. And they found at the end of analysis that the comprehensive year round coverage of Eber gave them the best available data to make these maps. Uh, and again, it's not really either or. I don't want to make it sound that way, because in most cases, the, the combination is better than either one or the other. But the point is, it is starting to be used in real applications. Okay, limitations again. Uh, certainly, if you look at the maps, huge biased urban areas, areas that are easy to access. Uh, I mentioned lots of variability in data quality, um, biases some people like, you know, some birds more than others. Um, and some of those papers that I've mentioned, they have found mixed results. Uh, in other words, it's not always as good as breeding bird survey, but a lot of times it is. And again, it's usually not bad, um, but uh, you know, it's not the gold standard, let's put it that way. And again, in most cases, they find the best is to put two or more databases together, gives you the best uh, um, results. Um, Again, same with being bird survey, not a lot of people in the north, so there's sparse data up there. And you know, the fewer observations, the harder it is to make good models and have reliable results. And again, uh, oh, too early for 10 years, not enough uh, for really good trend stuff, but that's coming. You believe me, it's, it's coming. And again, uh, only applies to birds. Uh, strengths, again, massive observer base, base uh, enough to make up for a lot of those shortcomings. It's huge plus is that wide spatial scope that nothing can touch that, you know, hemisphere wide graph or that mapping I just showed you. A uh, strong analytical team, Cornell, you know, top notch, doing a really good job um, and excellent data products as I showed you. Certainly potential for basic and applied research and conservation decision-making, it's early days, uh, I, I, you know, this isn't like everybody even knows 
enough about it to do much. People are all scratching their head, just like you know we are at Nature Alberta. How, how do we make this work? So, so it's, it's early days, but it's definitely happening. Um, I'm going to end off with iNaturalist. Again, I'm sure a lot of you have used it. Uh, for those of you that don't, again, couldn't be easier. Uh, get the app. Uh, this isn't work on the same checklist principle where you go and record everything you see. It's more of, um, I've seen this lichen. I'm curious. Uh, I'm going to take a picture of it. So it works on photographs, not count. So you, you know, saddle up to, to what you're interested in, take a picture of it. Again, you've got the... Um, location, exact GPS location, and you've got the time. And that whisks it way, uh, away into the database again. Um, in this case, you're asked to make an identification. Um, if you know, you just type it in. If you're not sure, again, this is going so fast, you're already starting to get uh, machine learning suggestions available to you. They'll say, here are three options. Uh, and it doesn't work perfectly. My wife and I used it this summer and you know, half the time it's wrong. But it'll, when you don't know where to start in your flower book, <laughs> it gets you going a lot faster. And, and that's not the end of the story. This is the first crack at identifying. So it gets uh, sent away. Um, so you share. The thing I wanted to point out here is this project. So um, if you don't do anything, it ends up in this big, huge barrel called nature, iNaturalist Observations. And there's things you can do with it, certainly, and people are doing stuff with it. But you can also, as a, let, let's say you're doing frogs. I'm going to switch species now and, and look at leopard frogs. Say you're kind of interested in this and you want to start, a, start up you know, something like Frog Watch locally. Well, you can set up a prog project, get other people involved, get them excited about frogs and send them out. And all the data will end up, it'll end up in the big pot, but it, you'll also be able to access it as a, and, and you can also add other attributes if you want. You don't have to be stuck with the default. And in fact, uh, Elizabeth Bobby and I were having a good chat the other day about maybe doing that with Plant Watch. So, you know, when does the first flowering and when does it end? You can, you can write those in and put it in a project and share it. So that's a really cool new thing that's, that's come along. It's not that new. Okay, just the background, also a newbie on the block 2008. This one started um, California Academy of Sciences and uh, National Geographic Society. Um, locally, we've got Canadian Wildlife Federation and a few others involved. Uh, global again, 89 million observations. No, not near as many as eBird, but come on, be fair. eBird, you just have to put in, I saw 23 you know, Canada geese. Here, you have to take a picture of every, every single one. Um, as number of users, 13,000, actually more than eBirders. And uh, as I said, you put in that identification, that's the first crack. It ends up in a database and it says needs ID. And there's this whole group of volunteers that goes and helps confirm identifications. And uh, once it gets two or at least uh, two thirds of people agreeing, then it becomes what's called research grade. And it ends up you know, and, uh, to be used in, uh, well, in a variety of different places, but it's kind of a higher, higher rank. There's no ongoing data analysis, the same way as with eBird. It, you actually have to work with it yourself or just work with the raw points. And again, freely available. So just quickly here, what happens when you go into iNaturalist? Well, I just did this quickly. I said, oh, let's look at spiders. So you put arachnids in there. Just Alberta, very easy to filter. So all of a sudden, we found 5,700 observations of spiders in Alberta. They're, they're already in there. And this is early days, 185 species. And you can go and then click and see who's seeing what, where. And you get a little Wikipedia page if you want to know more of that kind of stuff. So that's the first part. Then the other things you can do is, uh, I'm going to use the example of leopard frog. And the reason is, uh, for this the magazine issue that just came out, there's, a, there's an article on leopard frogs submitted by a student <clears throat> at the U of A. And it kind of the story stopped 10 years ago. And, and she didn't have time to take it anywhere any farther. But I, I said, you know, people are going to want to know what's happening now. We can't just stop. Because what happened is <clears throat> there hasn't been any update in the um, uh, there's usually a status report every once in a while. There hasn't been anything in, in a decade. So it really hasn't been anything published. So, well, let's go to iNaturalist and see what they have to say. Well, you, you 
you know, pick the species and again, you generate a map. Now this is not that modeled map where you actually extrapolate and fill in all the blanks. These are actual observations or counts of how many people saw a leopard frog in that, that square that they have here. And lo and behold, most of them are in the Eastern part of, of America. The other thing you can do is zoom in. You can zoom in on that map or you can download the data, which I did. And all the red dots are actual iNaturalist observations. Free, easy. The other thing I did, the, the uh, blue squares are Government of Alberta has its own um, database, a fish and wildlife uh, database. Uh, that one, not so easy. It's not public. You have to uh, ask nicely and they'll provide it. Um, I think I have to give up my firstborn, but something like that. It took about six or eight emails to get it done, but eventually, you know, it is possible. Uh, something that, you know, certainly citizen science is better at. So if you look at that article in the magazine, this is the map you'll see. And it was, you know, half generator of my naturalist. Another example is this critter, uh, which my wife and I encountered at uh, Wainwright Dunes. I'd never seen, like it's almost two centimeters long. I said, what the hell, I, I, you know, is it on this planet? And I, I'd never seen it. I, I thought, well, okay, put it into iNaturalist. Two days later, it, it's a goldsmith beetle. Uh, you know, I guess if you have a friend that's a, you know, a bug expert, you don't need that. But, uh, you know, for the rest of us, uh, that, that, was, that was the thing to do. And the other thing was, you can map out where other people have observed it. So it turns out, this is me here, this little red dot. That's the furthest Northwest sighting of a goldsmith beetle that's been recorded, uh, or at least documented, put down. They, again, they live down, down in the South part of the States. So as far as um, having surveys of rare and threatened species, no government database is going to have anything on these beetles, but this is a place where you, you can find it. Threatened species like the leopard frog, invasive species. Now there is a government initiative to map invasive species and they rely on citizen science. It doesn't work without them. And so uh, they have their own app, but you know, iNaturalist certainly I think can play a role there as well. Uh, then there are also fine scale inventories of specific locations. That's these bio blitzes you probably have heard of, started out in, in parks, uh, but now it's a big thing in urban areas. And uh, it's starting to be used in regions as well. So I came across one in Arkansas. There are two counties, they really want to know what lives in there. And they set off with iNaturalist and a bunch of, of folks and, and, and went ahead and did that. So again, limitations, same as a, a bird, urban, easy to access, species biases, no doubt about it. Um, it what's different here is it is quite a lot harder to model because you don't know, you only know that there's a presence. You don't really know if other areas have it, but it hasn't been looked at or if it's really absent. So it's a lot harder to model abundance and stuff. And the same with the bird connections are only started to be made with the research community and resource managers. Now, strengths, again, massive number of observers, global scope. The neat thing here are the photographs, and they're all um, uh, a Creative Commons. So all the photos are available for everyone to use. So that's, that's pretty neat, great data sharing, um, easy to use. And as I mentioned here, you can set up these projects, which I think will have a lot of, um, benefit for people who want to look at certain things or find them in detail. Now, uh, I'm pretty much out of time. and I knew I wasn't going to get through all. There's, like I say, hundreds of other initiatives. I just, I'm mentioning here a couple or a few of the common ones. Uh, uh, Alberta Plant Watch uh, is one that I, I said we're going to have a really hard look at to see if we can't make that work in iNaturalist. Uh, there are other things that don't work on the existing apps, like Alberta Lake Watch by the Alberta Lake Management Society. They're, they're doing water quality. That's not going to work with an app, but they, it is a citizens, purely citizen science driven initiative. Uh, invasive species, as I said, that's going to be huge uh, in iNaturalist. But right now, there is another app called Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. They need another acronym, right? <laughs> There's something a little catch here, but there, there is one. Um, Christmas Bird Count, don't want to leave that off. Very similar in a lot of ways to BBS. One that we run or help coordinate to Alberta May Species Count. Uh, one I wanted to draw your attention to here is, is brand new just getting started, Alberta Citizen Science Community of Practice. 
So it, it, the idea here is to help make the connections, if I understand correctly. So it's, it's just getting started. And uh, I have great hopes that that will be the way that you know, the naturalist community who does the observing will be able to strengthen or make those connections with the user community, community in, in more detail. So just two slides left. I know I'm a little bit over. Um, I just some tips, I thought. As I said at the beginning, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having fun. I hope everybody has fun out there. Uh, and it doesn't have to be more than that. But if you want to contribute to science, and to advance conservation, there are things that you can do when you're going out there and using these different apps. One that is clear is that, like a lot of things in life, the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out. So if you uh, do eBird, it's really quite important to do a complete checklist, not just a couple of birds you saw. And, I mean, you can do that and it won't get lost. But unless you have a complete checklist, it's not used in any of the analysis. And, and is the papers that I read don't use them either. They, they filter. Is it a complete checklist? Yes, oh, well, we're gonna use it. So you wanna contribute, make sure you give a complete checklist. Uh, consider being a breeding bird survey volunteer. Again, the Cadillac always need help there. There's this identifier community I mentioned. All of these different initiatives need volunteers to help out. Lots of opportunities to, to do stuff. Um, next, when selecting a structured pro project, that means something that's set up to do for a specific purpose. I think it would make sense to, to, to put forth the question or try to find out who's running this and what's the purpose and the products. Because some of them, for what I might guess, or not guess, but my feeling, I'm not sure, is that some of them are a little bit on, they started a long time ago and they're on hold. They may not be doing a lot or maybe not producing a lot. So you want to do a bit of homework to see that what you're doing is really being used. Uh, some are more than others. When it comes to unstructured projects like the iNaturalist where you just put the data in into the bucket, um, uh, there are a variety of those. And I, I think it would make sense to focus on well-established platforms with wide data sharing and a large user base. It's the platform effect. It's why Justin Bieber is famous, not his, not his voice. It's because the bigger get bigger. And uh, the big are the ones that are gonna get the attention of the researchers and the resource managers. It is really hard. Even my little frog thing, just trying to find all the different databases, it, I mean, you don't have time. So you go what I did. I just went to iNaturalist. I did try a couple others. Anyway, Use that information. If you want your observations to count, put them where they're going to get counted. Uh, lastly, uh, make an effort to travel off the beaten path. I didn't really show it, but if you looked at that frog uh, database, it's around Calgary and Medicine Hat and Lethbridge. You know, those are the hot spots. Take a trip. Um, I mean, that's where the data are lacking. You fill gaps. You're really those, each observation counts so much more because there are so few out there. Um, and try not to focus on just charismatic species, um, you know, with iNaturalist especially, it's, it's, it's all of them are important, especially invasive and threatened species, you know, the more leopard frogs, the better. And then last, they become part of the conservation community, learn about nature, engage with nature, advocate for nature. Happens to be our tagline of Nature Alberta. Can't help it. I think that's that's very very important, and I think that's where, where citizen science is heading, and that's why we're so keen to to expand our our uh, platform. So I'm going to end off with a couple of how can you learn more. Um, there's a lot of material out there. I'm just going to give a self plug because that's my job as ED. Uh, our website has. I would call it the basics. If you want to know some of the more popular sites and how to get going on them, it's there. Uh, I will tell you that by spring, when the snow melts, this will be revamped. It will go into a lot more detail of what's out there and what's to do and how you can engage. So um, our, our, our intention here is to ramp that up. Another thing, as Stephanie has mentioned, is our magazine. If you're interested in citizen science or nature in Alberta, there is nothing comparable out there 
that is going to uh, give you the window into Alberta's species and landscapes and conservation issues. Um, it, it's the place to go. I'm very proud of it and uh, I encourage all of you to, to have a look at it and maybe subscribe. And last but not least, in a show of blatant self-promotion, I'm cutting <laughs> out my book. If you're interested in the first part of the talk, on how conservation works and how science has a role and all that stuff. That's published here uh, for the next couple of weeks. I'm gonna knock 50%, Stephanie doesn't know this, I'm gonna take half the price off. Um, so all you have to do is put in the code on a store biodiversity and it'll knock half the price off. So I thought I, I would do that. So that is all I have. I apologize for going over. I had promised Stephanie I'm going to keep it to an hour exactly, and, and I didn't, but it's pretty darn close. So if anybody has questions, I still have a few, a few 